works were already completed on the Talmud Yerushalmi, um, Genesis Rabbah, Leviticus Rabbah, Pesikta de Rav Kahana. Um, for Palestine, and I, I was going to say for the Byzantine Empire generally, it's probably appropriate to refer to the sixth century as post-rabbinic. On the other hand, outside Palestine, I'm not, you know, it's not so clear how rabbinic it ever was in the first place. So to say post-rabbinic, um, I, I don't know, but let's, we can bracket that for right now. Um, in the other great rabbinic center, Persia, or what um, the rabbis called Babylonia, um, the situation is different. Uh, the traditional date for the completion of the Babylonian Talmud is the end of the fifth century. Um, Mid 20th sc century scholarship placed the completion of the Babylonian Talmud probably in the middle of the sixth century. Um, and by the end of the 20th century, um, Strack Stenberger Bachmuel in 1996 um, gives the beginning of the eighth century as the date for, you know, for the, the uh, more or less the version of the Bavli as we have it today. Um, so by the sixth, the, the sixth century date that works pretty well in Palestine is a little trickier for Persia since the classic, the great work um, of uh, rabbinic work of, uh, of the Babylonian rabbis was not yet completed. On the other hand, um, by the sixth century, other kinds of literature um, are beginning to appear in Babylonian Persia um, as in Palestine, um, even as more traditional style midrashim are being produced um, as well. So um, it's it's complicated to talk about post-rabbinic, but really, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's reasonable to speak, to speak about the sixth century on as post-rabbinic, if we mean rabbinic in the sense of classical rabbinic literature. Um, there's also a certain difficulty in using the term rabbinic elite, which I'm going to use um, many times during this talk um, for a post-rabbinic age, right? So I guess I should be saying post-rabbinic elite. Um, we don't know very much about the successors to the rabbis in Palestine in the sixth and seventh centuries, and Palestine is probably the more um, relevant location for what I'm going to be saying. Um, I think that the texts I'm about to discuss have in mind a learned elite who preserve and develop classical rabbinic traditions. So I think it's okay to call them a rabbinic elite, but I want you to, you know, to be aware of the, um, the complexities. Um, finally, I'm going to be talking about messianism and I'm going to try to restrict what I mean by messianism to eschatological scenarios that actually involve a messiah. I'm not sure I will always do that as neatly as I should, but I'd like to be able to distinguish from, for my purposes today between messianism and eschatological expectations that don't include a messiah. Okay, so that was, that was terminology and now I really want to get going. Um, I want to begin my discussion with two works from the early post-rabbinic era, and I'm more confident about the date of one of them than the other, um, that accused the contemporary rabbinic elite, in one case, of insufficient concern for God's kingdom, the coming of the new age, um, and in the other case, the inability to recognize the Messiah when he arrives. The works in question are the Hebrew apocalyptic work Sefer Zerubbabel, and three homilies about a Messiah named Ephraim in another in a rabbinic work, um, a rabbinic collection called Pesikta Rabati. So I'll begin with Sefer Zerubbabel. Um, Sefer Zerubbabel can be dated with some precision, um, relatively at least. I mean, by the standards um, of dating texts from this period, um, since it knows the wars between the Byzantine and Persian empires in the first decades of the seventh century. It knows the Persian conquest of Jerusalem, um, which took place in 614, and it either knows or anticipates the Christian reconquest in 628, but it gives no hint of awareness of the Muslim army that would soon bring an end to the Christian restoration. Now, I should say, I, I'm, the, I'm following the consensus here in dating Sefer Zerubbabel to um, the early part of the seventh century. Um, Hillel Newman has recently argued um, for a dating um, to the middle of the sixth century. It, that wouldn't make much difference for my purposes, and I don't agree with him, but um, for, our, for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. So the um, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, I guess is the, the English pronunciation, um, who serves as the recipient of revelation in this work, um, is identified as the Persian appointed governor of Yehud, and this is a Achaemenid Persian, um, so back in the late 6th century BCE. 
Um, and this identification means that Sefer Zerubbabel um, is presenting itself um, as prophecy um, for more than a millennium before the time it was actually composed. Now, Sefer Zerubbabel contains the first account, or at least the first surviving account, of the two Messiah schema that is alluded to in a few passages in classical rabbinic literature, um, um, Genesis Rabbah, and particularly in the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud. Um, according to Sefer Zerubbabel, the Messiah descended from Joseph. Um, it calls him uh, Nehemiah ben Hushiel, uh, will preside over the return to Israel, uh, the return of the people of Israel to Jerusalem. He will rule there for 40 years. He will withstand the attack of the king of Persia. And then he will before that, uh, and then he will die at the hands of Armelos. Um, Armelos is the Antichrist. He is the son of Satan and a beautiful stone statue of a virgin, a not very subtle um, swipe at Christians. But his name also represents an Armelos as the embodiment um, of the Roman Empire. Um, after the death of, uh, of the Messiah descended from Joseph, the Davidic Messiah. Um, will manifest himself. His name is um, Menachem ben Amiel, um, and he and Elijah the prophet will resurrect Nehemiah. Um, and af after that, a new temple will descend from heaven. God himself will stand on the Mount of Olives. Um, it's important to note that Menachem is a suffering Messiah. He is described in terms drawn from the servant poem um, of Isaiah 53. Um, another notable feature of Sefer Zerubbabel that I want to mention is the role it gives to Menachem's mother, the mother of the Davidic Messiah. Her name is Hefzibah, and she is a warrior um, who serves as the defender of Jerusalem. So um, Sefer Zerubbabel is a messier composition um, than my description suggests. Um, it incorporates units that clearly had an independent existence um, before Sefer Zerubbabel. It doesn't spend too much time trying to make them fit together. Um, but despite this messiness, it is really a milestone in the literature of ancient Jewish messianism. It's the first full-scale narrative of, of the career of a messiah or messiahs. Um, and while it's certainly not as detailed as the accounts of Jesus's career in the New Testament Gospels, it is far more elaborate than anything um, in, uh, in the literature of Second Temple Judaism. Now, Sefer Zerubbabel's complaint against the rabbinic elite comes after the death of Nehemiah, when Menachem appears and announces his messianic mission to the elders and sages of Israel. The elders and sages meet his announcement with scorn because of Menachem's appearance. For all they see is a man despised in worn out clothes, Sefer Zerubbabel says, and that's language that um, the man despised um, is, is language drawn from Isaiah 53. Only when these scorners see that Menachem has brought Nehemiah back to life do they believe in him. Now, it's important to note that sages, um, the elders and sages are the ones who don't, don't recognize Menachem, that sages is a rabbinic self-designation, Chachamim. Um, on the other hand, the criticism is directed not only at the sages, but also at elders, which I assume must mean political leaders. Um, and I will also admit that the, the criticism um, is fairly gentle. Um, and it's gentle because um, Zerubbabel himself um, fails to recognize Menachem when he first encounters him at the beginning of the book. Um, and for the same reason, he doesn't look like what Zerubbabel expects the Messiah to look. So while Sefer Zerubbabel reports that Menachem was angry at the sages and elders, um, a reader will already know that he responded to Zerubbabel with a burst of anger too, and this doesn't disqualify Zerubbabel as recipient of revelation. Um, so um, it suggests that it's not, uh, it's, a, it's a forgivable mistake. Okay, with that, I want to turn to Pasita Rabati, to the homilies from Pasita Rabati. Pasita Rabati is a collection of homilies for holidays and special Sabbaths with a complex history of development. Um, but it seems likely that homily 34, uh, homilies 34, 36, and 37, an interrelated set of homilies with some very distinctive characteristics, as we'll see, that these homilies come from the sixth or early seventh century. Unlike Sefer Zerubbabel, which makes little use of the characteristic um, 
aspects, features of rabbinic literature, the three homilies in question are composed in the style typical of the homiletical midrashim um, of the classical, uh, of the classical Palestinian homiletical midrashim. Um, like Sefer Zerubavel, they feature a suffering messiah. Um, in this case, a lone messiah. Um, he is named Ephraim, but he is the messiah descended from David. Um, and as in Sefer Zerubbabel, an important source for the description of this suffering messiah um, is a suffering servant um, in the book of Isaiah. Now, Menachem's suffering in Sefer Zerubbabel is expressed primarily through his appearance, or his identification as a suffering messiah is expressed through his appearance. Ephraim's suffering is described in, in more theological terms. Uh, it's the result of an agreement he makes with God to undertake seven years of pain in the lead up to the eschaton um, to ensure that even the sinners of Israel may be redeemed. God assures him that he may choose otherwise, but Ephraim decides to, to uh, devote himself to the, to the redemption of the sinners of Israel, um, and he embraces the terrible task, we are told, with joy and gladness. Now, in homily 34, we learn of a group called the Mourners for Zion, whose yearning for God's kingdom exposes them to the mocking and scorn of other Jews, including the righteous of the generation. Um, so in this homily, language from Isaiah's servant poems is applied not to the Messiah, but to these mourners for Zion. The central theme of the homily is the mourners' vindication as the scorners recognize their mistake in the period of turmoil leading up to the eschaton, and God himself proclaims that he rates the mourner's devotion to his kingdom above the devotion to Torah of the righteous of the world. And this is quite a remarkable sentiment in a text that stands self-consciously in rabbinic tradition. Um, uh, the, the rabbis um, of the Babylonian Talmud and, uh, and elsewhere um, often tell you that um, uh, study of Torah outweighs any other virtuous activity. Um, but here um, it turns out that yearning for God's kingdom um, is dearer to God than devotion to his Torah. Um, so I take this to be a kind of revenge fantasy, but it's a pretty gentle revenge fantasy. Um, God quickly forgives the mockers, allowing the merit of their Torah to stand them in good stead. And he even forgives those who don't have Torah um, to, uh, uh, to, to speak for them. Still, um, I think it's notable that these two uh, works deeply invested in, um, uh, in, in um, a Messiah or Messiahs, that these two works um, do accuse um, the rabbinic elite of being insufficiently um, devoted um, to, to, uh, to the Messiah or to Messianism. So with, with these accusations in mind, I want to turn um, to, to survey rabbinic literature um, to, to get a sense of the Messianism um, that, that we can find in the classical rabbinic texts. Um, in his great essay toward an understanding of the messianic idea in Judaism, um, it was uh, Gershom Scholem claimed that an undiminished mighty stream of apocalypticism from the Second Temple period rushes forth within the Jewish rabbinic tradition. And you can see I'm quoting, the essay was published in German in 1959 in English in 1971. So, um, before some important changes in the study of uh, developments in the study of rabbinic literature. Um, and, and no contemporary scholar I know um, would accept this view. Um, indeed, much of recent schol scholarly discussion has focused on efforts to explain the movement from the rather limited interest and subdued expression of messianism in classical rabbinic literature to the enthusiasm, enthusiasm of later works such as Sefer Zerubbabel and Pasita Rabati. Um, Philip Alexander, who has discussed this question perhaps more than anyone else, characterizes the development as a U-turn um, by the rabbis to embrace what he takes to be popular messianism. Um, I would characterize the development somewhat differently, as will emerge um, from what I have to say today. Um, and I regret the consideration of time prevents me um, from saying more about the history of scholarship on this topic, which is actually um, quite interesting in its own right. Um, but 
Um, let me turn now to the to the rabbinic texts. Um, the earliest rabbinic works, works of the era of the Tanaim, the end of the first to the beginning of the third century, um, particularly the Mishnah, which is the most influential of these and the first to be published, um, published orally uh, at the beginning of the third century. Um, but also this is true of the Tosefta and Tanaitic Midrashim, so the other Tanaitic literature. Um, these works show, I think it's fair to say, only limited interest in messianism. They look forward to the coming of a Messiah descended from David, and this is certainly the most common messianic expectation um, of the Second Temple period and, and, and of the rabbinic era, but they have almost nothing to say about his character or career. Um, they also have little to say about the events leading up to the eschaton, um, the famous passage at the end of Mishnah Sota about the evils that will precede the coming of the Messiah is likely a later addition um, to the text. Uh, but the rabbis and their followers constituted only a very small segment of society uh, in the early centuries of the rabbinic era. Other Jews may have admired the rabbis for their learning and religious devotion, but the rabbis, I think it's fair to say, were an elite on the margins. Not until later in the rabbinic era did they come to play a more central role in Jewish society. It's likely, especially in the early centuries of the rabbinic era, the era of Tanitic literature, um, that many Jews did not share their views on messianism. Um, but almost by definition, it's very difficult to get at the more popular views. Um, and by definition, I say because, of course, only the literate write, and that means that all literature from antiquity is um, a product of elites. I mean, they, you know, the ability to write makes you, in a certain sense, a member of an elite. Um, now, there is some literary evidence for Judaism in the relevant centuries, apart from rabbinic literature. Most of it is associated um, with the institution of the synagogue, the liturgy, the targumim, that is the Aramaic translations of the Bible, um, and starting in the fifth century, Pew team poems, uh, liturgical poems that supplemented the Sabbath and, and, and Holy Day liturgies with themes appropriate to the day, often based on the, the Torah portion for that day. Uh, the synagogues of ancient Palestine were not rabbinic institutions in the sense that they were controlled by the rabbis. But the, while the literature of the synagogue is clearly intended for a wider audience than much or most of classical rabbinic literature, um, it is produced by some kind of elite. Um, the ornate language and allusions of the Pew team, for example, reflect a very deep learning and profound knowledge um, of the Bible. Um, and an elite that clearly has close relations with the rabbis. I mean, I, I don't mean to say that it's, it's, it is the rabbis, um, but I, I think it's fair to say that the influence of the rabbis is evident in each of the categories of, the, of literature that I've just mentioned. And I really can't follow Alexander in treating the messianism of the liturgy, the Targumim, the Pew team as reflecting popular rather than rabbinic Jews, uh, views, sorry. <laughs> so in other words, they, there's just too much evidence of the impact of the rabbis on those works to make me see them as um, evidence for popular messianism. I do think that there is um, some way to get at some aspects of popular messianism, I'll discuss it shortly, but it's not through the literature of the synagogue. Um, that literature, I think, is better understood as an expression of um, views the rabbi shared, rabbinic views designed, um, an expression designed for a more popular audience. Um, so for this, because I, I see a significant overlap between uh, rabbinic views and the views expressed in these other, uh, in these genres of synagogue literature, I, I think it's appropriate to turn to one striking example of the literature of the synagogue um, to examine what early, what the, the messianism of the early rabbinic era looked like. And that text is, is the Amidah, the Shemona Esrei, the 18 benedictions, the central prayer of the Jewish litur liturgy from antiquity until today. Um, and it gives you a really concentrated example of, of um, the kind of messianism that is um, typical in many ways of Tanaitic literature. Uh, some form of the Amidah appears to predate the rabbis, but they clearly embraced it. 
Uh, and we can tell this from allusions to its recitation and discussions of its content in rabbinic literature. Um, and I think it's likely that they influence the language of the formulations that have come down to us. So this, this is the text that um, I think you received um, as, a, um, as a PDF. Um, for a, this, is, this is what I would provide as a handout if, um, if this were uh, um, an in-person event. Um, so have a look, have, have the text in front of you as I speak. Um, uh, yeah, as, as I speak, I want to say I'm going to translate. Um, uh, the, the translation is not mine. The translation I found on the internet, and I'm sorry I don't have an author there um, or a translator listed because um, it, it did not come with a translator. I think it's pretty good. There's some, some little odd things going on, but they're not really important for us. Um, when, as I speak, I'm going to, to um, try to distinguish between the root um, uh, Gimel, Aleph, Lamed, uh, Goel, um, I'm going to translate that, Redeem, um, Yud, Shin, Ayin, um, I'm going to translate as Save. Um, I, I'm, not, I, 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 I'm not really sure what the difference between Redeem and Save is in English anyway, but there are two different Hebrew terms and I will try to uh, maintain two different English terms for them. Well, so the, the Amidah starts very promisingly for a scholar of Messianism. Um, in that first blessing, um, uh, God remembers, uh, the, the blessing asks, says of God that he remembers the pious deeds of the patriarchs and in love will bring a redeemer to their children's children for your name's sake. Um, now, I think there's a kind of tension and I think it's probably there on purpose between God's motives for bringing the Redeemer. On the one hand, he, re he remembers the good deeds of the patriarchs. On the other hand, he does it for the sake of his name. Um, I guess the sake of his name is a kind of, uh, um, at least for the prophet Ezekiel, kind of fallback. I mean, that, no, no matter what the people of Israel do, there's always, there's always God's name uh, to turn to. Um, but I think the thing that's the most notable for our purposes um, is if you keep this blessing in mind, um, turn to blessing number seven, um, and there um, we get that same term, that same language of um, redemption. Um, look on our misery, champion our cause, and redeem us swiftly for your name's sake. There, your name's sake. Uh, for you are a mighty redeemer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the redeemer of Israel. So we go from God bringing a redeemer, presumably the Davidic Messiah, to God Himself as redeemer. Of Israel. And in the blessings that follow, in blessing 10, it is God and not some other redeemer, human or otherwise, who is called upon to sound the shofar and gather the dispersed of Israel. In blessing 11, it is God who is called upon to restore Israel's judges and officials and alone to rule over Israel, to be king over Israel. The verb there is on the root is, is um, memlamit uh, kaf, to be, to be king. Um, and I think that's really very significant because after all, the point of a, a Davidic Messiah um, is to restore kingship to Israel. Here, it's God who is going to be king. And um, in blessing 14, it's God who is called upon to return to dwell in Jerusalem, to rebuild it, and to speedily establish there the throne of David. Um, even in the blessing that follows, blessing 15, in which the shoot of David finally makes an appearance, Redemption belongs to God. Speedily cause the shoot of David to spring forth and let his horn be exalted by your salvation. For we hope for your salvation all day long. Something slightly naggy about that blessing. Um, blessed are you, Lord, who makes the horn of salvation spring forth. So it, again, um, it, 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 it's really all about God. Um, so the Amidah, I think it's, fair to say, is deeply concerned with Israel's redemption, its return from exile, the restoration of Jerusalem, the restoration of Yavidic kingship. But it barely mentions the Messiah. Redemption is to be entirely God's work, and the call for the establishment of David's throne stands alongside the call for God alone to rule, and that problem isn't really resolved. Uh, in strictly quantitative terms, the Amidah is significantly more interested in eschatology, than the Tanaitic, than Tanaitic literature proper. It, that is, it devotes a far greater portion of its content to the subject. Um, and this is, I think, significant for understanding um, the rabbi's perception of popular concerns. 
On the other hand, um, as Ruven Kimmelman emphasizes in his essay on the messianism of the Amidah, the Amidah's view of redemption with the very limited role it gives to the Messiah is very similar to that of the Mishnah. Um, so with that, I want to turn um, to, to uh, the, the literature of the Amoraim, the rabbis of the third through fifth centuries. Here, messianic and eschatological traditions are somewhat more plentiful. Uh, the Talmud Yerushalmi and the Palestinian Midrashim, such as Genesis Rabbah, Leviticus Rabbah, and Pasikta de Rav Kahana, um, all likely compiled in the fifth century, um, have more to say about the end of days, um, including exegesis of Daniel's four kingdoms, uh, prophecy of four kingdoms, vision of four kingdoms, that makes Christian Rome the fourth kingdom, um, and also about the Messiah, including tra traditions about his birth, um, which we'll come back to, and his name in the Tom of Yerushalmi, um, very brief allusions to a Messiah descended from Joseph in Genesis Rabbah. But messianism is hardly a central topic, and in a way that's not surprising given the actual concerns of these works um, in the Talmud Yerushalmi, uh, matters of Jewish law uh, based on discussion of the Mishnah, um, which as we've seen itself has very little to say on these subjects. Um, in Genesis Rabbah, a running commentary on Genesis. Uh, in Leviticus Rabbah, homilies on the book of Leviticus. In Pasikta de Rav Kahana, homilies for special Sabbaths based on Torah portions. It's certainly not impossible to introduce uh, messianic material into any of these contexts, but um, these works focus on um, their, their job is not um, to, um, to set out that kind of material. Uh, the Bavli, also um, a work of the Amoraic and then post-Amoraic period, period um, the Bavli contains more messianic and eschatological traditions than the Palestinian works. Uh, this fact presumably reflects its later date. Um, also, I think its location in Persia, uh, where the relationship with Christianity is less fraught, and I'll have a lot more to say about Christianity in a few minutes, um, as well as its larger size. Um, and I'm, honestly, I'm not even sure that um, once you allow for the fact that the Bavli is by far the largest of the, of the works we're considering, that it has that much more um, messianic and eschatological material than, say, um, the Yerushalmi or Genesis Rabbah. Um, and though the Bavli contains more traditions about the Messiah than we find in the Tanidic works or the works of the Palestinian Amoraim, it offers only brief moments uh, in there uh, rather than a connected story. It would require considerable effort and imagination to make those moments fit together into a, an ongoing narrative. Um, it's worth mentioning two points of special interest for our purposes. The Bavli twice alludes to the death of the Messiah, son of Joseph, uh, though without providing a narrative that makes sense of those allusions. Um, the, the, the two allusions are separate traditions. They occur, though, in, in very close proximity on a single page of, a printed, of the printed editions. Um, and the Bavli also contains an episode about a suffering Davidic Messiah uh, described in terms drawn from Isaiah 53. Um, I'll return to those passages shortly, um, but first I'd like to argue that if we limit our consideration of rabbinic messianism to traditions about the Messiah or even traditions about the end of days, we miss some material that's of real significance for the discussion. Um, and I'd like to take Genesis Rabbah as an example, and I'm taking it as an example because I've worked on it. Um, I, I won't claim that it's typical. I haven't done the work I would need to do to, to make that claim with confidence. Um, and um, it's likely that it, it contains more of the kind of material I'm about to describe than other works do because Genesis um, is such a good platform for that kind of material. But I am confident that similar kinds of material can be found in other rabbinic works as well, even if not um, in the quantity um, that you find in, in, in Genesis Rabbah. Now, Genesis Rabbah refers to the Davidic Messiah. Um, it usually uses the distinctive title King Messiah. Um, it refers to the Davidic Messiah about 20 times in the course of its running commentary on Genesis. Um, Genesis has about 50 chapters, um, so that's not a huge amount of material. I apologize for the sirens going past my house right now. I hope they're not, you're not hearing them. Um, 
the title King Messiah, I think, implies or at least allows for the existence of other messiahs who were a different kind of messiah. Um, and I have already mentioned that Genesis Rabbah does indeed refer to a messiah descended from Joseph, um, sometimes called a, a war messiah, um, though only very briefly and without much detail. Um, more impressive from a quantitative point of view are 12 instances of that four kingdom schema of Daniel 7 um, that Genesis Rabbah manages to find hinted at at various points in the text of Genesis. Now, the significance of the schema, I mean, clearly it's an eschatological schema, but its significance um, really depends on context. It certainly expresses confidence in eschatological redemption. Um, and the identification of the last kingdom uh, as Rome signals that the end, well, that maybe that the end, it can't be too far away, or at least that the period of the last empire has always, already begun. Um, but the fact that the course of history is already determined could can be understood to mean that there really is no need for messianic activity. The divine plan uh, is already uh, in place and it will just unfold um, at the appointed time. And I think that's probably how it's functioning in Genesis Rob. Um, so the, the, this, the references to the King Messiah, the Four Kingdoms schema, they're not the only evidence for eschatology in Genesis Rabba, but I think they constitute the bulk of it. And on this basis, I do think it's fair to say that Genesis Rabba does not display a great deal of messianic excitement or enthusiasm. Nonetheless, there can be no doubt that Genesis Rabba is deeply concerned with redemption. The focus of this concern is the figure of Abraham. Now, as early as the Tanaim, the rabbis were well aware of many aspects of Christian thought. Um, they can only have become more and more aware um, as Christians moved from the margins of the Roman Empire um, to being the dominant uh, force, the, the, the legal and then the, uh, um, the, uh, the legal religion of the Roman Empire, the, the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. But rather than developing their own messianic scenarios in competition with Christians, the rabbis chose to compete on terms they saw more as more favorable. The competition does not appear to have been for adherence. Rather, it was to reassure themselves and other Jews that despite what Christians said and despite Christian success, God's covenant with Israel was still in force and that the Jewish understanding of scripture was correct and not the Christian understanding. One feature of the rabbinic response is to insist that Jews are guaranteed redemption simply by virtue of their membership in the people of Israel, their descent from Abraham according to the flesh, as Paul called it, when he assured Gentiles that they could become descendants of Abraham according to the spirit. Presumably in response to the Christian claim, the rabbis take physical descent with the utmost seriousness. Um, they allow for people who are not physically descended from Abraham to join the Jewish people, but they take physical descent um, as itself. Um, the default mode of someone physically descended from Abraham, we would say, is redemption. Um, they also emphasize how the merits of the fathers, particularly Abraham, guarantee the redemption of their descendants. Um, and think back to the deeds of the fathers, um, the, the role that that plays in the first blessing of the Amidah, and contrast the Christian view of what guarantees salvation. Many aspects of Genesis Rabbah's interpretation of the figure of Abraham should be read in this context. Here I will note only some of them and very briefly. For Genesis Rabbah's circumcision, according to the flesh, has salvific power. Genesis Rabbah also insists on the suffering circumcision caused Abraham, and likens the hill of foreskins that accumulated when Abraham circumcised all the males of his household to a sacrifice. Uh, but in Genesis Rabbah, as throughout rabbinic literature, Abraham's greatest deed was the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, the near sacrifice of Isaac. For the rabbis, Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son, a sacrifice averted only at the last minute by angelic intervention, guaranteed the redemption of his descendants. The rabbis were clearly aware that Christians viewed the Akedah as prefiguring the crucifixion. Genesis Rabbah insists that Isaac was a willing participant and even compares the wood he carries uh, to the place of sacrifice, the wood on his shoulders as, they, as he and Abraham uh, ascend the mountain, 
um, to a cross. Yet it is Abraham's suffering that Genesis Rabbah emphasizes. Finally, if the passages discussed so far present Abraham as the rabbinic Jesus, uh, to use the subtitle of an article by Ron uh, Nivelle, uh, Genesis Rabbah sometimes also presents Abraham as the rabbinic Christ. Um, I offer just one example, though there are others. Its point of departure of, 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 the, of this example um, is Melchizedek's blessing of Abram after he defeats the four kings in battle. Uh, in Genesis 14, 19, blessed is Abram to God most high, creator of heaven and earth. Um, Rabbi Yitzchak, in Genesis Rabbah 43, Genesis, uh, Rabbi Yitzchak claims that the blessing expresses God's appreciation of Abraham who provided food for travelers. Um, there's a tradition of Abraham's hospitality. Think of the three visitors um, in Genesis 18. And then encourage them to offer thanks to God. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to Abraham, my name was not known among my creatures, but you made it known among them. Therefore, I consider it as if you were my partner in the creation of the world. That is, Rabbi Yitzchak reads, Melchizedek's uh, blessed is Abram to God most high, creator of heaven and earth. Um, he reads creator of heaven and earth in the blessing as referring not to God, but to Abram. Blessed is Abram, creator of heaven and earth. He thus attributes to Abraham a cosmic role that Christians attributed to their savior as far back as the gospel of John. My argument then is that Genesis Rabbah's deep concern for Israel's future redemption is most evident, not in passages about the Messiah or the events that will precede his coming, but in its treatment of the career of Abraham. The depiction of a figure from the past in redemptive terms involves a conscious deflection of eschatological hopes to the past. The payoff is presumably the certainty of redemption this move provides, and perhaps also it's tamping down of contemporary messianic ferment and its possible dangers. Genesis Rabbah was completed well before the homilies of the Sita Rabbati, but the homilist of the Sita Rabbati 34 would surely have accused it of insufficient devotion to God's kingdom, despite its deep concern for redemption. Finally, I want to say a few words about the possibility of recovering some aspects of the non-rabbinic popular messianism of the rabbinic era. As I've already noted, there are traditions in rabbinic literature that recount episodes in the career of the Messiah or Messiahs. Several of those episodes show points of contact with the fuller narrative of Sefer Zerubbabel and homilies 34, 36, and 37 of the Sikh Rabbati, the story of the birth of the Messiah in the Talmud Yerushalmi, the suffering Messiah at the gates of Rome, and the death of the Messiah descended from Joseph in the Bavli. The Bavli's two references to the death of the Messiah descended from Joseph clearly presuppose a story to which they merely allude. Sefer Zerubbabel's narrative gives us an idea of the story that likely lies behind those allusions, though Sefer Zerubbabel surely has reshaped the story for its own needs. The traditions in the Bavli clearly expect listeners to know the story, and there is nothing in the Bavli's framing to suggest any effort on the part of the rabbis to deflate the story. This point is significant, because I believe that such efforts can be discerned in the story of the birth of the Messiah in the Talmud Yerushalmi and of the suffering Messiah in the Bavli. The Yerushalmi story of the birth of the Davidic Messiah on the, day of the, on the day the temple was destroyed reports that the baby Messiah disappeared, carried off by winds to some unspecified place, and that his mother wished him dead. I've argued that the rabbinic story is a parody of a popular story about the birth of the Messiah to a loving mother, a story intended to give Jews two heroes for whom they envied Christians, a Messiah already in existence and a mother for that Messiah. Sefer Zerubbabel's Hefzibah, the, the warrior mother of the Messiah, whose son was born long before his manifestation, is a later adaptation of the positive popular story in a context in which the Virgin Mary had come to be seen um, as the patron and guardian of Constantinople. The Bavli story of the suffering Messiah reports Rabbi Joshua ben Levi's encounter with him at the gates of Rome, the city in which Zerubbabel too encounters the suffering Messiah, where he sits among the poor and diseased, awaiting the moment he will be called on to undertake his mission. When Rabbi Joshua asks him when he will come, the Messiah answers, today, 
Needless to say, the answer pr proves false. And Rabbi Joshua is profoundly disappointed until the prophet Elijah explains to him what the Messiah meant. He was quoting Psalm 95, 7. Today, if you hearken to my voice. In other words, the Messiah means that he will appear only when Israel is worthy. This is a brilliant deflation of the hopes associated with the Messiah who has already been born, hopes that Sefer Zerubbabel and Pasikta Rabati 34, 36, and 37 embraced. If I am correct in my reading of these stories, rabbinic literature preserves some hints about an enthusiastic popular messianism that it attempts to subvert. I would note that the rabbis also appear to be uncomfortable with telling the story of the life of the Messiah or Messiahs as the popular traditions appear to have done. The story of the dis disappearing baby Messiah in the Talmud Yerushalmi constitutes a full, though brief narrative of a, of a messianic career cut short, but apart from it, rabbinic literature preserves only episodes. I'm going to finish up. I'm sorry to have gone a little long. In the Tanitic era, the rabbi's lack of enthusiasm for messianism presumably reflects anxiety about the ill effects of the two Jewish revolts against Rome in the space of 70 years, or three if we include the diaspora revolt, all revolts with messianic overtones. Later on, if such anxiety receded, the experience of living under Christian rule surely caused a different kind of anxiety, too much messianism around, and perhaps uh, particularly too much narrative, um, meant competing, too much messianism and too much narrative meant competing with Christianity on its own terms, a competition in which the rabbis feared uh, they would not be successful. The authors of Sefer Zerubbabel uh, stand self-consciously apart from the rabbis in their choice of genre. But the homilies of Pasik de Rabati indicate that by some time in the seventh century, some Jews who stood self-consciously in the rabbinic tradition thought otherwise. Thank you very much, Martha. For